the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with the renowned screenwriter James V. Hart. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to The Weekly Show. I'm your host, David G. Maloney. Tonight, we have the next part of our interview with screenwriter James V. Hart. Uh, James's work on the silver screen has been responsible for some of the most beloved classics of the 80s and 90s, from Steven Spielberg's Hook to Muppet Treasure Island to Bram Stoker's Dracula and the Robert Zemeckis film Contact. He's worked with some of the best and brightest minds of cinema. Uh, back with us again tonight to chat about his incredible career and his movies we all love is none other than screenwriter James V. Hart. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Well, that whole thing of, you know, coming in through the the, the back door, um, it, it kind of segues really well into what I consider one of the, the greatest adventure and discovery stories of all time, the 1997 film Contact. Ah. Um, if I recall, it took Carl Sagan over a decade to finally get the movie made. And sadly, he passed before its release. Um, yep. How did you first become involved with the script? And what did you know of Carl's work to get this film made by that point? Yeah, this was a tough one. Um, I was being, I know, I'm obviously, I, I was a huge Carl Sagan fan. It, it had to do with some of my sci fi a bit, but also his whole thing about the universe. And uh, and and it being so big that how can we just be us, you know? Um, I was finishing Hook and Dracula. Or we, I think we were on finishing production on on Hook, uh, and I was approached to to adapt the novel Contact. Uh, and I said no, uh, -uh. no, not, not, no. Um, it's Carl Sagan. I don't think that book is adaptable. I don't think it should be adapted. You know, it's uh, plus it, it, the book was full of religion and science uh, kind of diatribe, you yeah. know, back. In, and I said, you'll, you'll never get that to play certain places. And I just kept saying no. And they kept coming back to me and saying, come on, my agent, you read the, you know, you got it. This is, they're making, they'll pay you they'll, all this new stuff, you know, and it's Carl Sagan. I said, I know it's Carl Sagan, who I would love to hang out with, but I'm not going to do this book. And finally, I I said, okay, all right. There there were seven writers on this project before me, and mm. three directors. So I said, all right, let me see what's wrong. Why they can't? You got all these big name writers, all these Academy Award nominees, and what it, what what their problem is? Why they can't get a script that they want to shoot? I read a couple, and these were by name people that are writers that I respected. They had nothing to do with the book. They were just as afraid of it as I was. Uh, and I mean, except they had, I think one, one writer had a, had a, her son stole away on the ship to go to the only thing they had was to tr travel to the center of the galaxy. So then I found out, I said, how these, how are these so far away from the book? Did anybody talk to Carl? I found out that nobody talked to Carl Sagan, not one writer, not one director talked to Carl Sagan. I said, how is that possible? Well, you know, he's an author. He's this big scientist. He's not a screenwriter. He's not a... So I finally figured out, I said, okay, now I have a way to get out of this deal. I said, okay, first of all, Carl Sagan has to approve me as the writer. Carl Sagan and Annie Drian, his wife, who wrote the book, had to be a part of the development process. And you have to pay me all this money and fly my family back to New York and we have to go spend time with them, you know, and I figured that would be a no. Well, they said yes. And I found out that Carl was actually delighted that a writer wanted <laughs> to come and talk to him about the book. So we had a weekend. Linda Opes, the producer, uh, who uh, arranged this weekend up in Cornell, upstate New York, with our families. We were going to have a family retreat. Jake and Julia, uh, uh, Sasha and Sam, uh, Carl and my wife Judy and I and 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 Linda, we had a great time. And I just interviewed Carl like a journalist. Why did you write the book? What did you want? What do you want people to take away from this? Why is it important to you? What parts you know? And I would write down his answers. Yeah, you know, and so I we examined the book as if he were being interviewed about why he wrote it. 
And it turned out that all the a, a lot of the keys to that were there. He he just wanted kids to be excited about science. He also wanted us to wake up to the fact that that we weren't alone in the universe, and if we'd stop trying to kill each other and blow the planet up, and join that galaxy that maybe solve a lot of our problems here. Um, and he would look at my notes every day and grade me. But in that weekend, as Linda likes to say, we found the movie inside the book. You know, uh, and the big part, the big one was the book that when, when she meets her father in the center of the galaxy, it was not really her father, but it's the scene everybody's yeah. been waiting for. I just said to Carl, listen, there's no build up to this. There's no real relationship with her father in the book. It's not even her real father in the book. We have to build that relationship so that there's a great sense of loss and, and promise and anticipation. That's the, that's the scene the audience is waiting for. And he was very gracious that way. We built that whole relationship with her father um, so that his death meant something. And that was Michael Goldenberg who who really came in and and nailed the, the, the death of the father. Um, and uh, we spent two and a half years together. I was the greatest time I've had, you know, um, uh, with working with an author. Uh, we had two and a half years together with him and Ann and our families. Uh, and it was phenomenal and it's horrible to lose him yeah. just when we were finishing the film. Um, um, I didn't stay on the project. I was replaced. Hmm. I was, was kind of bitter. Um, and, but when I saw the final shooting script and I realized that's what Carl, that's kind of what Carl and I had, we had, that's the movie that we had found inside, uh, the book. So I ended up getting, uh, a nice credit, a very nice credit on the film, but it was sad that he didn't make it to the end. Um, I, I've got a couple of lines here from the film, and I don't know if they were from your tenure with the film or if they came after, but I, I'd like to know a little bit more about them. First is Ellie's line in the, to in the in the capsule, they should have sent a poet. Was that something straight out of the book, or was that your line, or was that something that the person who came after you put in? No, it's not in the book, but but we talked about uh, the, the, the poetry of, of the journey. I wrote a, I wrote a version of that, but I th that had to be either, um, who didn't get credit. Um, uh, Oh, come on, Jim, not my whole Goldenberg, um, uh, Minnow Mays. I think that's his line. Um, that the, 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 the fact that he did the, the line that fashioned out of what I wrote and what my whole Goldenberg wrote. Um, but it was not in the book. Got it. And it's um, a brilliant, it's a brilliant, brilliant oh, statement. Yeah, incredible. I mean, it, it brings tears to your eyes. Yeah. Um, uh, next is Ellie's line to Palmer uh, about Mrs. Kane. Um, I mean, that got her kicked out of Sunday school. Uh, I mean, that, that line is such a deep cut biblical reference. You, you have to be pretty familiar with the Bible, or at least the Scopes Monkey Trial, to know what she was referencing there. Was that line from you or Carl or the person or somebody who came after you? I think and that's that... probably I think that's probably Carl. Okay. Uh, the but I do remember the line that whole that whole discussion they have at that at that party got changed a bunch and it's the and it was a favorite scene of Carl and Ann and I's that that Zemeckis didn't shoot, um, where Josh tests her faith with a full cult prism, where you he it was a prism where you you it's like the balls on the chain. Mm -hmm. And the principle is you raise the ball up this high, it will not swing higher on the other, on the other arc. It'll, it'll only go the same level that gravity mm -hmm. will stop it. And he tests her uh, and um, she swears she won't flinch because she knows the laws of the, the physics and she flinches. So he, he would say, you didn't even have faith in your own, in your own laws, but the, the cane, the cane line, I may be in the book because the book was full of biblical references. I'd have to go back and look at that. Um, the last line that sticks out to me is the one Ellie's father says to kind of bookend his appearances in the film, small moves. Um, was that line taken from the book or was that your creation? Well, I thought you were going to come up, you were going to ask me about the line about it, if it's just us, it seemed like an awful waste of space. Yes. Well, and that's that, another great and, and that's the line that everybody asked me about. Um Small moves. I think we had that's a version of what was in the book, but I'm not sure because it was uh, all about baby steps, you know. Or I yeah. think originally it was baby steps. Small moves. I don't. I don't know where that came from, but I remember baby steps. But I'm sure that that came either from Minnow or from 
or from Carl or from uh, from Michael. The line that I thought you'd hit me with is the line that is repeated three times in the movie. If it's just us, it's an awful waste of space. Everybody attributes that to Carl. That was me. It's not in the book. I found it in Thomas Mann's Tom, Thomas Mann's book um, uh, on uh, coming uh, coming of age in the Milky Way. Tim Ferriss's book. Uh, and t man said this long quote from the 16th century, you know, if God went to all the trouble to create the, uh, the heavens and the skies and the earth, you know, it seemed like vapid and what a not terrible, you know, and I just shortened it to that line. Um, Carl gets credit for it. It's fine with me. But that was the line that he said, that's the, he didn't like it at first. Then he said, that's the theme. That's the best scientific argument stated in the simplest, the simplest possible manner. It that we had, there's light, it has to be life out there. Back to, to contact though, was there anything from your own life experience that either consciously or subconsciously bled its way into the story? Yes. Yeah. Um, my, uh, we used to live up in the Hudson Valley and we had great, uh, in, in Socrates and mm -hmm. in West Camp, not far from you. Yeah. Uh, and they had great asteroid showers. Uh, if you remember, I mean, you always, there was some time during the year we'd have a great asteroid shower. You go up to Overlook Mountain and watch him yeah, from Magic yeah. Meadow. But we were, yeah, but we were right. We were in the. I was had my son on my shoulders one night. He was about four or five, no, three or four. And we were this beautiful night, and uh, there was a. We were out to watch the, the meteor shower, and it was pretty spectacular that night. And we're we're he's on my shoulders, ooing and eyeing, and um, and he finally says, um. Dad, who's out there? Not what or is God or heaven. Who's out there? And that got me because that's I've always I, I I've since a very early age that's been my thing is who's out there and can I go and can I get on the ship and go can I get a, can I get picked up can I can I be abducted? Uh, and that stayed with me. And I wrote contact at that house in in West Camp in the wow. snowstorms um that got me three-year-old kid who's out there and that's the kind of outward urge and the kind of outward uh desire and gravitation you know gravity pulling you away from earth instead of to earth that i think carl was talking about is that inquisitive curiosity that keeps us wanting to expand and explore and that's what he wanted and that got me and that stayed with me all while writing writing the script I would always remember that moment with Jake, who's out there? Because that's what the movie's about. Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, contact is kind of both fundamentally scientific, but also kind of, a, a, you know, got like you said, the religious balance in it in kind of the best of ways. It, it blows my mind that in Carl's book, it ends with the idea that there's actually a rational intelligence, not just obviously behind the wormholes and transportation system, but behind the entire universe itself. I mean, coming from the mind of Carl Sagan, I mean, what do you what what did you what did you actually make of make of it the first time you actually read the story yourself? Um, once I got past all the religious stuff, uh, at, at the at the center of it was exactly what the solution to so many of our problems would be: is let's stop spending money on killing each other, and let's start spending money on trying to join this galaxy, the citizens of the galaxy that that Carl said we can go do. Um, and work towards that kind of, like the joints, the, all the private space programs right now are so hopeful and positive. And that's exactly what Heinlein said would happen. As soon as, as, as private industry takes over space travel, then we'll all go to space. We'll all get there, you know, and that's what's happening. And I, I keep waiting for it to catch on even more instead of being so controversial who Elon Musk is or who, what Brands is doing, you know, look at what's happening. We're going to the space we're going back to the moon. We're going to Mars. You know, that's what Carl wanted. He wanted a robust science community of citizen scientists as well to, to that's what we should be doing with our time. You know, that's what we should be doing with our efforts and our dreams instead of um, what religion and what God, you know. There was a line that's not in the movie that Carl and I and Anne wanted that I wrote. No, yeah. Your God is too small. 
and it was an argument that Ellie would have with Joss about what was wrong with his with religion. That my God, you know, his, your God's too small. Mine's the universe. It's not divisive. It doesn't create divisions. It doesn't start wars. It doesn't punish people. That's the universe. You know? And um, Zemeckis wouldn't shoot it because it offended. It had a religious offended to one of our actors who sure remained nameless. Uh, but that was a line I wished had been in the film, and um, it still gets me that it's not. Because she was talking about something that the universe, the, if you think of of the universe as being bigger than anything, God in a box that you pull out when you need it is not God. With kind of how the, the book ends, but the, but the film ending is a little bit different. I've only learned recently that the end uh, of the film is not necessarily your favorite piece of writing in no. your stellar resume. What no. do you think of the ending all these years later? And is there still anything you wish you could have done differently to wrap up the film versus the story? Yeah, there is. We we had we wrote a completely different ending uh, that Carl liked, that uh, Annie liked. Um, uh, the ending for me is ambiguous. Uh, Zemeckis did not want to have it be de definite that it happened. He wanted it to be questioned. Did it really happen? Did it not happen? In the book, it happened. Uh, and Ellie goes through that whole brilliantly uh, scripted um, uh, interrogation scene that, that Goldenberg did, um, uh, and where she can't make herself use the word faith. And the only thing that, and, and our ending was, 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 Carl wanted to there to be proof that it happened. Uh, and in the in the book Pi, the equation Pi was the thread that tied all that together. If you carried Pi out far enough, you would see the artist's signature. There'd be some point where those transcendental numbers took on a shape and a form that was not um transcendental. It was suddenly it, it was the artist, it was a you know, it was, it was the artist signature that the, the universe was created by higher power that you don't have to have faith to believe in. It's a math equation. Math is 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 the, the language of the universe, not preachers and what have you. So we had a scene where she's at the array with all the telescopes, um, and she has a kid. She and Joss have a child. Joss is off somewhere in South America, and Sam is like two years old, three years old. And they've given her a big, giant computer to carry out pie. So we see all that. And she's with she's giving a school tour. You know, and the, and uh, she can't find Sam. The nanny didn't know where Sam went. So she goes into the computer room, and there's Sam sitting in the chair just looking. You know, wow. And all of a sudden, the screen locks up. And you begin to see these concentric, perfect circles form zeros. And the circle doesn't exist in nature, except as a cell. The nucleus, you know, the, your nucleus, your cells, that's where the perfect circle exists in nature. Um, and, um, and Ellie realizes that wherever you are in the universe, pi times the radius square is always the same. Every piece of matter is connected through the same kind of nuclear, same kind of cellular structure. We get some matter that drops in from the outer space. You can go in and, and, and carbon date it because of its, its composition. Um, and then you went to um hr Haddon, who was dying and being sent out into space and you start seeing circles pizza basketball basketball hoop baseball you know um uh circles that, that are that we know about every day that are still related to what's out there uh and so she knew that it happened and she had now proof that it happened and zemeckis wanted to keep it ambiguous uh, that's why you only the only thing you get is when uh Jimmy Woods um, talks to to uh, oh, just went over her name, the the vice president, and they talk about the eighteen minutes of missing data on the recording. That's the, uh, interesting. That's the only nod you get to it really happen. Yeah, and I think Carl was he was adamant about that the world understand this was real. It happened. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a hoax. You know, and that's gone to me. So I'm, it's not a satisfying ending for me. Was that something that he was fighting for? Or was it something that didn't make it? Had he, had he not passed when he passed, do you think it would have made it in? 
I, I don't know. I was so far out of the loop at that By point that, point, that, um, that okay. you know, however that decision was made, there was nobody that could resist it because it was Zemeckis. And listen, he, the, the movie works on so many levels. He did an incredible job. You know, it's just that there were things that, that I know Carl, were important to Carl that didn't get in. There were things that were important to me that didn't get in. But the movie experience, you can't, you can't, comp can't argue with how people connect to that film. Oh, I, and I was going to say, you know, uh, what you know, on the flip side of what we were just talking about, what was it like seeing that film with an audience for the first time, and what kind of reactions did you did you observe in, in the room? Oh, I was in it? tear. I mean, I saw it by myself again, like I saw Hook, mm -hmm. uh, and when Carl's name came up, I just lost it. You know, for Carl, yeah, um, I didn't see it with an audience until the world premiere. I flew in from London, and Jody was gracious enough to let it invite us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the audience, I mean, my recollection of that audience was they were totally enthralled, you know, and, uh, if the audience doesn't know what's not there, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, it, their yeah. reaction to what's there. Oh, they, they don't, don't know, know what's, what's been cut, there. so they don't know what they're Unless missing. Unless they read the book or something, but so I can't, I, I always go back to that. The, it's the audience that makes and breaks our work, not us. Doesn't matter how brilliant we are how good we think we are, the audience is who determines whether we succeed or fail, uh, whether we can do it again. You know? Oh, it's, uh, it's true. And, I'm working on something right now, and and there's things that we cut, and they're never going to know what they could, what, what could have been, but, you know. I yeah, think I, I, start, I, start, I start telling hook stories, and people go, oh, my God, really? I mean, they, they love the movie. So let the, the audience is our ultimate arbiter, uh, and... I try to teach that in all my classes, all my workshops, all my mentoring is, is, is that you're not writing for yourself. If you're in this business, you're not writing for yourself. I don't care what director or ad writer says, oh, I just do this for what I, you know. Oh, no. You're writing for the audience. And if you don't make the audience part of your process, if they're sitting behind your shoulder, what, what do they know? When do they find out? How do they find out? Are they happy when they find out? Do they need to know more? When, you know, if you're not aware of that audience presence when you're writing, you're going to, that's what happened on, you know, you're going to come up and, and make mistakes and forget things and, and leave things out that they're going to say, wait a minute, why is that person doing that? Or why am I not, you know, and I'm lost. You know? Anyway, I'm on my, on my teaching rant now, so I'll shut up. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we've, we've obviously only had a, a couple of our favorite films from your incredible repertoire here. Uh, so, but but what else can our audience be on the lookout for in the future? Is it that new uh, adaptation hey, that you're working young on? Hook. The, the hook young, hook, young Hook, Young uh, Hook. Jake, my Jake and I are doing it. Uh, we have some animated things in the works. Um, uh, I'm also writing a, a script about uh, uh, Christian Dior and the first Asian model that he hired right after the war. It was a big controversy. Um, very different for me. Um, and, uh, I, I, but I think the young hook is the one that, that is putting me back in the fantasy world again, which is a nice place to be. Well, Jim, thank you so, so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Well, my pleasure too. And, uh, all I want to say is that all, for all you writers out there, I want you to think of yourself as something besides just being a writer. You're also a job creator. And for all of you that don't understand that, you watch the end credits and don't turn them off or flip them over when it says skip credits. You watch all those end credits. Every one of those people have a job because some writer had the courage to type the end. Truth. Truth. Yeah. Thank you so much, Thank you, sir. Jim. Ladies it. and gentlemen, Jim Hart. That's our show for tonight. A special thanks to screenwriter James V. Hart for joining us once again. And thank you so much for watching. Stay safe, everyone.